Let me ask you something. Which fast food place do you think has the best fries? Not asking that, it makes me feel like I'm one of those, uh, those children's YouTubers that has, like, the Mr. Beast-style captions and whatnot. I know this is one of those generic engagement bait questions that makes up 99% of the content posted to threads, but it's actually very relevant to this video. Personally, I'm thinking maybe Five Guys, although I know some people don't really count Five Guys as fast food because it's a little pricier. And I saw when Charlie made his tier list, he had picked Popeyes. And he also had Taco Bell in the top tier, which I actually never had Taco Bell fries before. Popeyes, though, is a solid answer I hadn't even considered. I feel like, though, the vast majority of the time this question comes up in real life, people say McDonald's. And hearing people say McDonald's has the best fries always kind of pains me. Because, I mean, the McDonald's fries that I grew up with, yeah, 100% absolutely. That era of McDonald's fries was just untouchable. But those fries they got now, the ones they've had for a couple decades, those are not McDonald's fries. They, they suck. I mean, they're better than Burger King fries, but they're not good. And I know this is not just nostalgia talking. It's not just memories of half my little baggie of fries winding up underneath the car seat. These fries changed in horrible ways. And it's all happened because of one man. So today, we're going to take a look at the story of Phil Sokolov, the man who ruined McDonald's fries. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. You ever go to watch a movie or stream a song and you see, hey, this isn't available in my location, but it is available somewhere else. For example, recently I was thinking about the movie City of God. It's been a really long time since I watched it. It's not playing in the US though, but they do have it on Brazilian Netflix. So I finally do what so many of you have told me to do throughout the years. I come to Brazil with the help of NordVPN. Then boom, Cidade de Deus. NordVPN has thousands of servers worldwide, so whether you want to hide your real location for security purposes or just watch something that's not available in your area, Nord's got you covered. And you can do this on all of your devices. One account allows you to secure up to six devices at one time in any combination. Right now, you can get a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus four free months when you use my link, nordvpn.com slash wang. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash wang, or click the link in the description below. Despite being known as a burger place, depending on who you ask, it's really McDonald's fries that made them. Their self-described founder, Ray Kroc, wrote as much in his memoir. The quality of our fries was a large part of McDonald's success. One of my suppliers told me, Ray, you know you aren't in the hamburger business at all. You're in the french fry business. I don't know how the live in hell you do it, but you've got the best french fries in town, and that's what's selling folks on your place. And all that came tumbling down because of one man named Phil Sokolov. Born in 1922, Phil always had a desire to be the center of attention. He took up tap dancing at the age of six, placing first at the local talent show. It was the start of a showmanship that took a different turn three years later. The boy learned how to sing, impressing family at weddings and bar mitzvahs. He dreamed of being a vocalist, but was stuck working at his father's fruit market. That only changed after high school when he was able to leave Nebraska and pursue a singing career. His next four years were on the road with a succession of different bands. They performed in ballrooms and nightclubs across the country. Phil embraced this lifestyle until turning 21 when it felt like it was time to settle down. He returned to his home state in search of a stable source of income. This took him to construction where he built houses, sometimes two at a time, off speculation. It was during one of these jobs that he realized suppliers were overcharging. That meant that he could easily undercut his only two competitors. This culminated in 1955 with the launch of Philips Manufacturing Company. It was such a success that the venture ultimately made him a millionaire, and these profits only soared as the company grew over the next 10 years. By all accounts, this man was already set for life as he got married and started his family. It seemed like there was nothing in the way of his comfortable retirement. But then it happened. On October 27th, 1966, Phil suffered from a heart attack. Given its mortality rate at the time, the 44-year-old survival was something to celebrate. Yet he couldn't get over the fact that it had happened at all. Phil elaborated on this dilemma in an interview. I was thin. I did the Royal Canadian Air Force exercises every day. I ran a mile every day, under seven minutes. My blood pressure was low. I didn't smoke. I knew how to handle stress. I had a wonderful wife and a happy marriage. Phil was in otherwise good health, which made this heart attack seem random. That is until he consulted a doctor who warned about cholesterol. 
Cholesterol is a fatty substance used for many essential functions of the body. It's harmful in excess as it can build up in the arteries. His levels were dangerously high at 300 milligrams per deciliter. This, as it turns out, was a reflection of the patient's poor diet. He was addicted to hamburgers, hot dogs, and anything greasy. Upon learning this, Phil was prescribed a low-fat diet, and it lowered his count by half. This completely changed the entrepreneur's attitude towards life. He obsessively researched this subject on his own. By the end, he knew enough about this topic that he would proclaim himself an amateur cardiologist. Which tells me that in the modern day, Phil would have been the most annoying type of Reddit commenter. This information stuck with him for years, informing all of his decisions about how to eat. However, for now, it was just limited to his own life as this was early research. It's important to recognize that at this point in time, there is still a lot of debate over its connection to heart disease. This was the 80s, man. That continued until the publication of a 10-year-long study in January of 1984. It was the first conclusive evidence that lowering cholesterol could prevent heart disease. It found across 4,000 men that lowering cholesterol by 25% cut the risk of a heart attack by half. This paper was sponsored by the federal government and came with dietary guidelines. It recommended a lower intake of cholesterol as well as fats and saturated fats. There was fear over the fact that the average American's cholesterol level was well over 210. This was met with backlash from companies who felt this was poor publicity for their products. Phil saw this as an opportunity for him to take initiative, to both save lives and to honor his late wife Ruth. Ruth had passed two years earlier after a 15 year struggle with cancer. In spite of this, she managed to raise two kids and founded a school for blind children. Her resilience taught him to be more empathetic to the health of others. He drew a million from his personal bank to form the National Heart Savers Association. The goal was simple, to draw attention to the dangers of high cholesterol. During the next four years, NHSA sponsored free testing for 200,000 people across the United States. That included more than 10,000 congressional staff and members of Congress. In 1988, Phil successfully lobbied to designate April as Know Your Cholesterol Month. This resulted in a historic record for cholesterol tests. His efforts were paying off, but he never got a response from the industry. A month later, he sent 11,000 letters to food processors asking them to stop using tropical oils. These letters were inflammatory, calling them accessories to death and threatening a media campaign. Few bothered to respond though, and those that did were very dismissive. With their position made clear, he followed up on his threats, purchasing a series of full-page ads that October. The headline declared it as The Poisoning of America in giant bold text. He identified the culprits as 10 of the world's leading manufacturers. It warned the public that their lives were at stake, with an assortment of America's favorite foods. The ads were placed in several major newspapers with a campaign that cost about $140,000. They incited a reaction so intense that it surprised even Phil. He was quickly inundated with threats from corporate executives and their lawyers. Many attempted to fight publicly, calling him a quack and irresponsible. But as sales plummeted, they began to concede, with all ten of them agreeing to use vegetable oils by January. Phil succeeded and was hailed by the public as an underdog. I feel that I have developed a rapport with the American public. They like the fact that a little guy in Omaha is sitting here and taking on Nabisco, a $25 billion corporation. I've had some success, and I've made a lot of money, but compared with Nabisco, I'm a pimple on an elephant's fanny. Not only that, but his motivation literally came from the heart. He frequently spoke of the heart attack that came after eating too much fast food. It was just a matter of time before it became the focus of his crusade. And this brings us back to McDonald's. Beef tallow is a rendered form of beef fat used as both an ingredient and for cooking. It was a staple to the franchise as part of their elusive Formula 47. This secret recipe entails a special mix of beef tallow and oil blend. It dates back to the brand's inception, being used to fry the very potatoes Kroc fell in love with. Of course, the saturated fat now proved controversial amid these health concerns. Many chains, including McDonald's, had already begun to fry some products with vegetable oil. But that change was far from universal, with potatoes always made an exception. This self-admittedly came down to a matter of taste, as the fries were much more temperamental. That, of course, didn't suffice as Phil took aim at the figurehead. McDonald's is the leader, and consequently, when you say McDonald's, you were including Burger King and Wendy's. It may seem like a Herculean task, but by then he'd already spent two million for the NHSA. So on April 4th, 1990, Phil launched another wave of attacks. The Poisoning of America Part 3 
They focused on the nutrition of the restaurant's hamburgers while promoting a call to action. It called on them to cut beef tallow and lower the fat of their meat by 10% to give our kids a break today. McDonald's was quick to rebuke the PSA, claiming he was spreading misinfo. Their lawyer even warned outlets not to reprint the ad. That request fell on deaf ears, instead of being thrown out to the public. And his message had a demonstrable effect on consumers. A poll revealed that 38% decreased their intake of fast food in response. That was reflected in the response of companies even early on. In spite of their rebuttal, McDonald's pledged to provide good nutrition. They test-marketed grilled chicken sandwiches, pasta, and celery sticks. Low-fat options were also added at the beginning of May. However, they were adamant about keeping their special mix of beef tallow, which sparked another wave of ads in July. Their stock began to fall. The pressure was mounting, and only getting worse as one by one their competitors folded. And ultimately, it proved to be too much. Eventually, McDonald's was forced to follow in their footsteps. On July 23rd, McDonald's announced it would ditch its original recipe. This was in favor of a blend of corn and cottonseed oil. Absolute garbage. And it was all just as Phil predicted. Soon enough, the entire industry changed its way. This was only the beginning of a continuous effort to slim down fast food. Chains began introducing all kinds of healthy alternatives to their usual burgers and fries. And McDonald's never credited Phil with this change. They claimed their decision was the result of an eight-year-long study. This apparent breakthrough was supposed to be a way to preserve the french fries taste. Which, if you've ever had the original recipe, you know that is absolute nonsense. I'm not stating an unpopular opinion here. If you've ever had them before, a lot of people will tell you that nothing compares to those old McDonald's fries. You even had an episode of Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Revisionist History, where in 2017, he dedicated an episode to the signature flavor, the old signature flavor. This was put to task with a blind taste test in which a set of millennials was asked which they prefer. The subjects voted unanimously for the beef tallow fries. This was similar to the motivations of Luke Fader for Atlas Obscura. In 2020, he wrote about his hunt for the original french fry recipe. This search took him up the corporate ladder, as well as less conventional sources, fast food experts, museum curators, a 79-year-old employee from the very first McDonald's. It was through this investigation that he found that one recipe purported to be the true one by a historian was in fact the real deal. It was part of an unlicensed McMenu PDF that offered methods from the 50s to 70s. Though its author remains anonymous, they claim to have managed a franchise while the McRib was being developed, which places it before 1981 well before the NHSA campaign. Luke cooked several batches and even fed it to someone who had eaten McDonald's back in the day. It was accurate enough to bring back memories from the man's childhood. The author then reviews it himself with glowing praise. The McMenu PDF fries pack a serious punch that left my palate screaming for more. A subtle, beefy umami saddled neatly next to the underlying sweetness from brining. The crisp, browned edges provided an audible crunch. The insides retained a sweet, buttery texture. My only complaint was that I had to stop eating and photograph them. They are hands down the best fast food fries that I've ever eaten. The instructions are available in his article for anyone who's interested in trying the recipe for themselves. With all that said, this isn't even close to the end of the story. There is intense debate over regulations for detailed ingredient labels. It was to be made mandatory with the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act of 1990. The bill passed the House of Representatives but languished in the Senate. That was largely due to the protests of food processors. Because of this, Phil ran $650,000 in national ads calling for the public to act. And they overwhelmingly did, to the point that he was credited with the eventual passing of the bill. The bill's author, Representative Henry Waxman of California said, His ads played such an important role in educating the public and the Congress. What he was able to do on his own as an individual is an inspiration. This bill is a tribute to his tenacity. He'd wear this as his greatest achievement, helping fill aisles with nutrition labels. Following this, his public profile was reduced with most of his efforts taking place behind the scenes. Those days as an outsider were over. His calls were always transferred to top executives they knew by first name. There were some notable exceptions to this, though. He later argued against 2% milk, encouraging parents to buy skim instead. In 1997, he urged Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods not to endorse McDonald's. And throughout it all, he remained a local celebrity, being invited to sing at the Omaha Press Club. Diet fats are extreme, they are difficult dreams. 
you will find eating lean keeps your arteries clean and life gets more exciting with each passing day his last ad came in 2002 it was to discourage fellow omaha native warren buffett from buying burger king the sheer commitment showed it wasn't a bluff when he claimed he had enough money to carry on indefinitely. Two years later, Phil Sokoloff passed away at the age of 82. His eulogies revealed that he'd spent $15 million in the fight against fat and cholesterol. They remember him as a crusader, willing to sacrifice his personal fortune for the good of the public. But as we approach the present day, many have started to question whether or not he'd actually done more harm than good. By this time, much of the research that he cited has been discredited as pseudoscience. Originally, this research was propped up due to manipulation by the sugar industry. In 2016, an article was published in JAMA regarding documents from the 1960s. It found that research had been funded to downplay the risks of sugar and highlight the dangers of fat. This wasn't disclosed when their findings were published in 1967. They then minimized studies that suggested sugar's role in heart disease. The Sugar Research Foundation paid to have them discredited in a literature review. For example, a study that found benefits when people picked vegetables over sugar. This was dismissed as the dietary change wasn't feasible, and these efforts allowed them to influence the overall scientific discourse. If that wasn't bad enough, the vegetable oils that Phil championed were heavy in trans fats. These artificial fats were far worse in relation to cholesterol, which of course you might remember caused its own scare. It escalated to the point that in 2008, McDonald's switched again to ease the fears of heart disease. They currently use a mix of oils that lack these fats, but there is evidence of this being the case as far back as 1956. By the time Phil's ads ran, the scientific community was well aware of the dangers of trans fats, yet he continued to blame saturated fat for his heart attack. The impact of his campaign is felt to this day, with many still believing in the same low-fat rhetoric. Despite all this though, I do think that he really believed the things that he said, and that he really thought that he was doing what was best for the world. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And unfortunately, that cost us the best fries ever. So yeah, I got a personal message for Ronald McDonald. Ditch the vegetable oils, get rid of the seed oils, bring back the beef tallow fries. Anyway, that's the story of why McDonald's fries suck now. If you like this video, be sure to turn on notifications and check out another one of my food-related videos, Lemon Party. I'm out.